The Not Your Normal Sunday Show. I'm Jeffrey Darty. This is my good buddy, R. Wayne Steiger. And ladies and gentlemen, I just got chastised before we came on the show. I got chastised for saying that I'm like a 12-year-old boy that loves comic books because I kept saying that we're going to change the world. We want to change the world. And <laughs> I know it's kind of campy and silly and goofy, but Wayne, I really believe, I really, truly believe we're changing the freaking world. I think if you change it one thought at a time, you're changing it. Absolutely. I was thinking more about changing it one person at a time. But okay. I understand I'm a little bit woo-woo. I understand I'm a little bit extreme. I understand I'm a little bit out there. But you are not going to convince me that I'm not changing the world. And this person wasn't trying to convince me. It was just kind of <laughs> funny. So it sounds like a comic book. I'm like, yeah, I know what you mean. Hey, like, listen, but... <clears throat> Every great religion started from one person, one thought, one idea. Absolutely. And Warrior Princess is in the chat room. Hello, and Wayne, the other day on her birthday, she did a video that was titled Jeff and Sandra. And so we started watching it. And before long, we're bawling our eyes out. Sandra's at her family's uh, vacation. They're bawling their eyes out. And here's Warrior Princess talking about her last birthday she didn't like who she was this birthday. She's happy. She's empowered. She's strong. And, of course, she said it's because of Jeff and Sandra. We know it's not because of Jeff and Sandra. It's because of her taking yeah. the reins of her own life. But, Wayne, you know, that's the reason that we do what we do. And that's the reason why I think I'm changing the world. And that night, Scotty Roberts goes on the show that we do, crying his eyes out about the thing you brought up, about calling favor on your enemies, saying thank to us for bringing that. And I'm crying my eyes out again. <laughs> and it's just, it feels so good. Sometimes, you know, it's very, it's very fulfilling to know that, like, I'll go over 15,000 probably here in the next couple of days. It's so fulfilling to know that there's that many people that care and listen. But when you actually see that you, and we had this lady we just talked to, got out of a bad situation, changed her life. And it's just so gratifying when you actually see that you're really having a concrete, dramatic effect on people's lives and their lives are actually changing. Thank you warrior or uh, warrior princess and nigel yeah uh, yeah when they're from the heart they say um i remember a scripture that said that uh we're gonna have to start a jesus jar for you wayne just like uh like Scott. <laughs> you gotta put in the kitty every time you say jesus yeah yeah it's like you know i remember a time of the tears the tears are tears of the heart are um and I don't know this, but it'd be interesting to do it to see if there's a chemical difference between those tears and let's say a tears of pain, tears that are manufactured, be something. I guarantee you there's a difference, Wayne. I'll bet you there's a, an alchemical difference between sad tears and happy tears. I'll guarantee there is. I, yeah. I'd, I'd put money on it. I, 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 would, I, I would tend to agree with you on that, Jeff. It would make sense. And hello to the beautiful Sandra D who's in the chat room. Hello, Sandra D. Hello, everyone. How and are yeah, you? I want to grow vegetables. I don't want to grow anything else. And hydroponic, I believe, and Wayne can correct me, is how to grow vegetables in water in limited spaces. So that's what I was talking about. And it got off to another description, another whole genre, Wayne, that I had <laughs> no plans of doing it. Did you say you got off onto an exit that you weren't even anticipating? Uh, yeah, we, we took the wrong <laughs> exit. Oh, listen to this one. You'll love this from Nigel. I can't think, I can't believe I didn't think of this, Wayne. It says, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the lie. <laughs> Just one F short. I love that. That might be on a T shirt before long. That's good. I like or aquaponic, that. maybe is the right word instead of hydroponic. Well, that's, that's really the future of farming. Um, you know, the elites know this. Uh, I know in Silicon Valley, there's lots of investment money going into that because. It gives you a controlled, sealed environment, not right. depending um, on nature's resources. It's pretty amazing, though, to think that you can grow in water and it will give you all the things that the soil will give you. And in fact, with the depleted soils that we have now, it's probably far better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I was talking Friday night to uh, Doc Ram on my channel and the fact is, is that the UV radiation up here has gotten so bad that it's very difficult to grow certain plants now um, outside. 
Absolutely. And what people don't realize is, I mean, you can go to the grocery store and you can buy what's called organic broccoli, for example, but that organic broccoli is grown in soils that are so leached of their nutrients and vitality. And then if you take it home and put it in a microwave, you're eating something that at the very least has no nutritional value and at the very worst has become toxic. So here I go again, get rid of your microwave. It's killing you. Russia doesn't allow their citizens to have it. Wayne, you are the second person other than yours truly that I've ever heard say that Russia has outlawed microwaves. And I have a subscriber in Russia and I told him just cold, call cold. I texted him or whatever you do on tweet. I tweeted him, I guess, on Twitter. And he said, oh, yeah, they're illegal. You can't buy them. And if a restaurant has them, they, they are taken out and, uh, and destroyed. You cannot have microwaves in Russia. And what a crazy thing, Wayne, to think about. You know, we think of the Cold War and, you know, Rocky versus Ivan Drago and all that stuff. And today, today, and I remember Billy Graham said this a while back, and I'm not a fan of Billy Graham, but he got in a lot of trouble. He said it, and it looks to be true that Russia is now more of an awakened free country than the United States of America. Red pill, blue pill. In talking about making changes in people's lives, Gary Baxter said he threw his microwave out due to, due to me over a year ago. Well, you made the decision to throw it out. Can I share a funny story, Wayne, about that? Sure. So right, on the, right at the end when I was preaching, I was preaching a big um, nationwide meeting for the Seventh-day Pentecostal Assemblies. And it was in Idaho. That sounds right like on, a partying group. Oh, it was great. <laughs> and it was on this river. And I was preaching one night, and I got on to the um, TV thing, you know, HBO was Hell's Box Office, Cinemax, S-I-N-A-Max, you know, the cable coming into your living room is like a, a sewer line coming into your cable, you know, wet <laughs> sewage on your floor. Yeah. And I said, if I were you, I'd take my TV and throw it in the river. And I, they'd, st they'd rented me a nice RV to stay in. So the next morning, I get this knock on the door, and here's this game warden, and he says, I'm looking for... Reverend Darty, I'm like, oh, that's me. He goes, sir, I j it wasn't a game warden. It was a, uh, what do they call the park ranger guys? Yeah. And he says, Mr. Darty, could you please not tell your followers to throw their TVs in the river? Because we fished out about 15 TVs out of the river. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't uh, mean to throw it in the <clears throat> river, really. But people are so silly. And, it, and it, it's, it's scary sometimes, the power of suggestion of someone that's just because they're standing behind a pulpit, wiping their own sweat off and anointing people with it doesn't mean they're right. God, you know, I think I've, Wayne just shook his head in disgust at me. Really <laughs> no, no, it's, it's the, what amazes me is to see exactly that, how people react, you know, this past 168 hours was a week of discovery. And it was. so, Here's the thing. It's odd. So when you talk about this whole thing by people following what you say is the reason why they're following you is that they thought that you had a connection to God that they didn't have. Right. And that you were getting somehow messages from God that they were seeking. You know, it's very interesting. I wonder what made him think that, Wayne. Uh, listen, I don't know. It's odd. I'm still on Kenneth Copeland's mailing list. And, uh, so this email came across and it says, hear from an authentic prophet of God. <laughs> Was it Kenneth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm going, wow, you know, there was a time I'd have bought that hook, line, and sinker. Let's oh, go, Jack. Yeah. I'm going to hear the Lord speak. <laughs> you know how you can tell that Kenneth is a, a, an authentic prophet of God? <laughs> How's that? Because he has multiple jets. Oh, and we're not talking. Listen, I helped him buy that first Citation 10. Shame you, on you. No shit. Excuse me. <laughs> I was sitting in San Jose Airport watching, waiting, waiting for a United flight to get back to Denver. And I watched this because in San Jose is where all Zuckerberg, all of them are that. Um, and this new Citation 10 pulling out, and I'm looking at myself, waiting to board, and I'm going, you know, I helped buy one of those. I should at least get one free ride on I it. I should at least get one free <laughs> ride. If somebody so, asked me, Jeff, do you know if any of your 
old uh, church people ever watch you. I don't know. You know, when you come into the church, they give you the right hand of fellowship. On the way out, I got the left foot of fellowship. So yeah. I don't think many people watch me. Um, I did. It's funny. I saw a guy that I was very close with, started a church with uh, on YouTube, and I wrote him. I'm like, hey, brother, nice to see you. How you doing? And I got back a message that says, I am not your brother. Please do not contact me ever again. And we were Whoa. tight. Not feeling the love in the room. <laughs> no, no, no. I wasn't feeling the love at all. Wayne, let me ask you a question. Sure. I know that you're very big on the Sumerian, Sumerian tablets. What if I respond to this postulation? The emerald tablets of Toth are the oldest revelation of spirituality to humans on this planet. I have no way to authenticate that. Um, that's my problem. Uh, where I can look at the clay tablets, that that can be actually dated. It can actually be zeroed in exactly where it came from. Uh, the Emerald Tablets is one of those books like um, Marshall did with the uh, bronze books. You know, yeah. um, same type of thing. You've got these writings that, indeed, they're, you know, I've read the Emerald Tablets. I found them fascinating. But do I take it as gospel? Do I take it as literal? No. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm in the middle. Of, I just went through the second tablet, and I'm you know, doing this on the channel. Yeah, I saw that. Tablet. And I tried to read the Emerald Tablets for at least a year because about a year ago, this person I didn't know named Sandra D. started sending me these emails you should check out the Emerald Tablets. And I kept hitting delete and delete and delete and delete. Because <laughs> I tried to read them and it was like sucking mud through a straw, Wayne. I just couldn't read it. And then I meet Sandra finally. My, my heart chakra blows open. And now the Emerald Tablets speak to me with, with great clarity. And it came to me, your heart chakra is green. Your heart chakra is emerald. And you can't understand the Emerald Tablets of Toth unless your heart chakra is open. So that's why I couldn't do it. Yeah, now they make great sense to me. And you didn't even get a brain freeze. I didn't. <laughs> well, that's, that's, so, that's what so often happens. I, I love your metaphor on that because um, when people really begin to connect and when things been, begin to get in line, um, you get that sudden gulp. And it causes you brain freeze and you're going, what, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. That, you know. <laughs> then there's when you have it. Low. I mean, on the um, 12 Days of Christmas song, you know, there's, you know, one, I don't know about the swans are swimming and all that. Do you remember what it is for seven? It's seven. Is it seven lords a leaping? I think it is. That's so amazing because in the second tablet of Toth, second emerald tablet, it talks about there's seven lords. Mm -hmm. And I was just talking with Sandra about this this morning. It seems like even you know, whether it's people that are against you or whether it's, you know, the high level Illuminati, they, it seems that they, they have this, they have this, if it, I don't know if it's an egoic need or if it's some kind of cosmic code that they have to show their hand a little bit to you. It is, well, I was taught this a long time ago. They have to disclose. They can't do anything in secret. But Wayne, what I'm, and, and, and it, it's weird if that's a cosmic law, explain to me why, like on a, on just a personal level, people that are trying to come against us, they will even give, like they come in and they make up these fake usernames and stuff and they still feel compelled to tip their hand like, oh, it's really us. When they're trying to be, you would think they're trying to be serendipitous, not serendipitous. They're trying to be whatever the word is for secret that I'm trying to think of and can't find that it. it is an S, but they still actually, even though they're trying to be secret, even though they're trying to spy, even though they're trying stealth. to go self, even though they're trying to go in espionage, they still have this compulsion to say things or do things that let you know, oh, it's them or connected with them. What is that? Is it cosmic? Do they have to follow a cosmic law that even they don't understand? Or is it just ego? Two things. You say it all the time. I do too. You got shirts that say it. Number one, you are sovereign. Mm. And I still am convinced that we are spears. We are merely going through this temporal experience 
we interact with other spears. Sometimes our spears actually touch. And like a throwing spear? No, no, no. A round spear. Oh, a spear. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I think that there, I have seen this, you know, 23,000 days on this planet, that there isn't anything that I don't think can be done to you unless there's somehow another, a permission that has been given by yourself. Because otherwise, there would be no need, if you were of no consequence, they could just roll right over you. I think you lost me a little bit. Try to dump right. it down for me a little bit, if you can. You are a sovereign spear. Right. You are, in fact, uh, as I keep meditating on this, it's, it's always been in front of us. I am. I am. No wonder that's so all over even the Christian scriptures. Yes. You are, you are the divine. Absolutely. All right. So when people come against us, and like you said, they have to tip their hand, they can't do it in a way that violates your sovereignty. Now, here's the thing. Let's say someone does a video about you, me, whatever. That never and happens. Wayne. Never happens. <laughs> and they, they just start making all these wild accusations. Well, two things are going to happen. Number one, you give it permission by allowing it to dwell up here. Mm. If you reject it and say, doesn't matter anyway, I'm going to go on, then it's been rebuffed. And it frees you. I mean, when I was yeah. sitting there like, oh, I'm going to get that. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm, you know, ah, I got it. And you start calling favor as you instructed me last week. You just start calling favor. And it's an instantaneous change in your frequency. It's an instantaneous change in where you're living and where you're vibrating. Set it down here. Now you're way up here. And I've been trying to tell people, I get these emails, well, what if it doesn't work? You, you're oh, missing the point. It's not for the person that is, that you're calling favor upon, it's for you. And if you're in, yeah, if you're in the high frequency, if you're in the high resonance, whatever they say doesn't harm you. And Wayne, I, I got a further revelation on it because you remember the old, I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say bounces off <laughs> me. And it sticks on you. On you. <laughs> but we don't want that because I don't want to be, a, you know, putting myself in a shield. And if a person comes against me, it bounces off and it goes out to them or it goes out to somebody else. I don't want that. I want to be able to absorb that negative energy that's coming into me because heaven forbid I'm shielded up. They send bad energy to me. It bounces off me. And all of a sudden you get stuck with it. Sorry, Wayne. <laughs> I was just thinking about me. So yeah. I've discovered, I believe, a way to take that energy in, purify the evil and the, the intentions of it and use it for my own life. So it's not just oh, let's put a shield and let's reflect it back to the person. That's still vengeful. That's still imprecatory. There's a good biblical word. Ooh, that's it. a great word. Boy, that, 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 that's song. a 25. That one? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> but we got to move beyond. That's what, you know, it's like Jesus, the Lord, the Savior, the Master, whatever he said. He said, love your enemies. Loving your enemy isn't shielding yourself up and hoping that they throw something at you and it bounces back off and hits them right in the face. That's not loving your enemy. Loving your enemy is, okay, you're going to throw stuff at me, I'm going to take that flaming arrow, I'm going to blow it out, and I'm going to put it in my quiver and use it to help me be a better person, and I'm not throwing stuff back on you. It makes me feel a whole lot better. It makes me a better man. It makes our relationship way better, and they're going to have to deal with their stuff. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's, it's amazing to me because I used to be in that circle. It was like it was you and me and us three, and that's it. You us know, four and no more. No, well, that's it. Us four and no more. Because it's amazing how the um, commandment of forgiveness is so easily, uh, how shall we say, altered in interpretation. Yep. <laughs> well, I can forgive him because he's within our circle. You know, we, we understand how he works. That guy? That guy's a racist, bigoted. We got to come against them. You know, they're against our foundation, our moral. They're trying to kill us. <laughs> and the next thing you know, you got this freaking war going on. Yep. Yeah. And Wayne, you know what the real truth is? There's only one circle. 
Yeah. And we're all in it. We're all humans. And someone that I really don't like said to me, at least in a roundabout way, through an email, aren't I a divine being too? Don't I deserve to be treated like a divine being? And I'm like, damn it. <laughs> He's right. Yeah. He is a divine being. He does deserve to be treated like a divine being. That doesn't mean you let people push you over or run over you, but you still give them the favor that they deserve as a divine being while still maintaining your own personal integrity and standards. But so there's let, one circle, Wayne, we're all human. We're all in it. So let me tell you how what you just said has been. And I think one of the veins of the problem, this is a great show, by the way, it is, you know, I think people ought to listen to it. <laughs> anyway, when we say I am a divine being, the question that comes to me is, okay, so now we have to define divine because my, my core image of divinity has been basically molded by the religion indoctrination I was in. Yep. And then this leads to the following, and I'll, I'll throw this at you because you are the 20 20 years as a Pentecostal preacher, and I mean... Oh, yeah, that and $5 will get you some coffee somewhere, see, and I'm going to tell you what, well, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the Pentecostals are like the hardcore. We were the Jesuits. Yeah, yeah, I ain't no, no kidding, it's serious. So, we say we're divine. So, divine means divinity. Divinity means that it is the one, or connected to the one. But what I can't understand, because here's what my interpretation or impression has been of divine, God. First of yeah. all, God apparently needs worshipers. Listen, follow me on this. I'm with you. Second, he seems or it seems to need religion. Yep. I don't understand why it would need an army or angels. And how many songs are there written about the army of God, like a mighty army moves the church of God? This is, this is supposed to be God, but the point is, is this is what we form our, at least I'm speaking for Emwa, that that is what I begin to interpret divinity. What divinity means, I am God. I am equal with God. There was a song I remember back in the church that says, you know, I'm a friend of God. God is a friend of mine. Um, what a friend we have in Jesus or something, something like that. Yeah, and it's got, they've got a new version. It's very, it's very hip, by the way. And yeah. so then it comes back to this whole question. If divinity, what does divine mean? And you know what, Wayne? I came to a, a huge revelation about a year ago. Anything that's really, anything that wants worship is not a real God. Bingo. How can it be? How can it be? Worship is all about ego. Isn't it? Isn't it? 100% the... about ego. And if there is, a, if you believe there is a God, and I do, God cannot be ego. He, he, she, it, they has to be the opposite of ego. So anything that wants worship and especially anything that demands worship is not a God. There's no ambiguity about that. I mean, you know, that is ego. That's a, that's a huge revelation. That part just came to me about the ego. Do you imagine the ego it has to take to say, bow down and worship me? Or how about or this? Else. <laughs> bow down or worship me, or I'm going to throw you in a lake of fire. And you'll oh, yeah, like that's a choice. <laughs> Wayne, there's 3 billion people on earth that believe that and believe that it's right. A yeah. lake of fire, Wayne. Oh, I a mean. A lake of fire. Do you understand a lake of fire? Again, that gets into this whole question I had. You know, I, had, I did a, a video called A Few Questions About the Other Side. And I'm going, please explain to me how a spirit can feel. If it yep. doesn't have a brain, if, <laughs> what's, what's the, uh, go ahead. Fire. Yeah. Uh, just keep talking. Yeah. That how, how can I feel that as a spirit? If I don't have a cerebral cortex that is somehow or another interpreting electrical signals, or in this case, heat, 
that then I would be consciously aware of. Right. That's and a a, God says, worship me. Ah. <laughs> you see? <laughs> or I'm going to throw you in a lake of fire. How could that, that possibly be a real divinity? No, nah, that's crazy. It, it's, so why do so many people believe it, Wayne? Why is there 3 billion people that say Jesus is their Lord and Savior, and he's a, a God that's going to throw you in a lake of fire? Because they took the red pill, man. And they justify it by saying, oh, only if you don't agree with him. Well, what if, I'm, what if I went to Sandra, or you went to, oh, what is your wife's name? Let me remember. Lynn. Ah, I was trying to remember. Yeah. Or what if you went to Lynn, or I went to Sandra and said, I'm in charge here. You've got to do this or else. <laughs> How would that go in your house, Wayne? I'd be sleeping outside, man. What are you talking about? <laughs> it would go the same way for me. But yet we accept this God that does it to all of us. And then the contradiction of it is, I can tell you, go to Isaiah 45, and it says, let us argue with one another. And the strange thing in it, it says, remind me of your merits. Mm. Now, I'll give more credence to the book of Isaiah, being that you can trace that puppy. We, we, we get where that one's coming from. And so I'm thinking about this God. You know, it's, a, it's Hebraic God, but all right, I can dig that. And uh, although at one point in time, I'm doing a program on uh, Tutmos. Yeah. And um, whether it's Hebraic or Egyptian, doesn't matter. It says, come and argue with me. And that I find intellectually stimulating. I agree. And you think know. about your relationship with, uh, with Lynn. Oh, my yeah. relationship with Sandra. Yeah. Just this morning, you know, the whole um, quit saying that we're going to change the world. It's comic bookish. I really like that. It resonates with me. But she says it doesn't sound professional. It sounds kind of silly. And I had to sit back and realize, you know what? She's right. And I bet there's, I bet there, I bet you could count on how long you've been married to Lynn. We're working up on our seventh anniversary. So I bet in the seven, how long have you known her? Uh, Lynn and I actually met through a Christian online dating service. Was it um, the one that Neil Clark Warren started, eHarmony? No, Mingle, I think. Okay, I actually did a, 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 I did a, a revival with him when he was starting eHarmony. But anyway, so you've known her for how many years? Um, going on close to nine. I will bet that in the nine years that you've known Lynn, that there's you can count on one hand the times that you – disagreed with her intuition and i'll bet if you have every time you did it you were wrong yeah i yeah yeah i have great respect for this this is a wise soul with sandra we haven't been together nine years but we're gonna be and far more than that obviously but i know by who she is and by what i see in her spiritually if she says jeff i really feel that this guy is lavender and I'm looking at it, it's blue, I'm going to say, okay, baby, you're right. We're going to go with it because her intuition is freaking amazing. And women are like that because they're, they're all about the moon. The moon is about intuition. And she just knows stuff, Wayne, that you and I had to study into for 20 years. Yeah. I think so that's listen the gift. To your woman, and if you can't listen to your woman, you're with the wrong one. And I hope that you're not married for 20 years, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what I love about when you actually connect. You know, there, there's a communication that you don't even have to speak words. That's the truth. All so, it takes is, you know that old song, Just One Look, that's all it took? <laughs> just I one understand look. that very, 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 very clearly now. Well, I, I'm just going to show this real quick. I'm doing a lot of research, and I thought that this one was really interesting when we're talking about God, religion, and where we get these concepts from. So right now, the earliest records that we have are these three, Sumerian, Egyptian, and Aboriginal. Yeah, the earliest verifiable yeah. written record. Yeah, these two we can verify this one here mm. is supposed to be. Then we get the Akkadian, the Babylonian. Then we get Hindu. Now, this is really interesting. So that's about 2000 BC. Then after that, we get the Hittite. Greek, then the Hebrew, and even the Hebrew is subjective, 
as to when it actually came in, because oddly enough, there's a lot of controversy about this 500-year period. Which and Zoroastrian probably, came in right about that time, too. And isn't it funny that the Hebrews went around trying to destroy all them other dudes that were before them? Ain't that a fact? <laughs> oh, it's the promised land. God gave us a promised land. Only one problem. Somebody already lived there. Yeah, and if you lived it, uh-oh. So when you look at this, and you really begin to study this, and you look at it, and here's what I really wanted to get into. Roman. We don't think about the Romans as a religious, as a religious culture. But their influence became directly here yep. some 500 years later. You know, Wayne, the fact of the matter is that, and I know this from my you know, associate's degree in anthropology, humans have had the cultural capacity for religion for about 50,000 years, about 50,000 years. And why is that? that that's a question I actually had, oddly enough. You... Well, let me go past that to this other point first, and we'll go back to that. We've had the capacity for the cultural capacity for religion for about 50,000 years. 50,000 years. Christianity is 2,000 years old. Yeah. Christianity is a Johnny-come-lately religiously, and it has influence way out of proportion and do you really think that you can discount 48,000 years of human religious culture because the rich white guys decided they were going to push <laughs> <laughs> now there that let us just talk about this because that is actually brutally honest christianity is a white man's religion a rich white man's religion. Yeah, and and I, I'm not being racist and I'm being bigotry. I, I'm just simply stating a fact. It was started by a white man, and it is still controlled by a white man. And we're talking about Paul. And, and, and by the way, no matter how you slice it and dice it, folks, most people's perception of God is white. Absolutely. He looks like uh, Charlton Heston. What, what the freak is that? And if anything, what, he's black. And guess what, Wayne? It reminds me of Monty Python. It's good to be the king. In Christianity, <laughs> it's good to be the man. Because you get to tell a woman what to do, where to do, how to do, when to do. A woman was created just for your sexual pleasure. She's supposed to be in the kitchen making you a sandwich. You there you go. Owner and owner because it's for her own good, though. Because if she doesn't have a man ruling her, she's going to be having sex with all these spirits and angels. They really believe. And they said, it wasn't man that sinned. It was the woman. It's her fault, ladies. Why are you still going to Christian churches? Wake up and smell the bacon. Quit making that BLT and go live divine, sovereign, and free. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 listen, I am a firm believer. If you look at the ancient cultures, and the really odd thing is, is up until the time monotheism came in with um, the first Pharaoh, um, Archimedes, and... When you look at the cultures, the societies that were run by the female um, dominating thought. The matriarchies. The matriarchs, they were, they were flourishing societies. They were. And Think about it, that. Yeah. Because with the feminine in rule, wars are less likely. Intellect. Isn't that true? It, isn't it? You know, my wife, and I, I, I give thanks for her all the time. People say, do you give thanks to God? I give thanks to that infinite being that is beyond my conception to define as God. The inexpressible ones are what yes. I call them. Yeah. And I just figure it's like this. Favor was raining down on me, baby. <laughs> I tell you what, Wayne, you might be the second most blessed man on the planet. Yeah, right, 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 right behind you. I get it. Right behind me. <laughs> But that is what we've lost. And, you know, uh, the shirt is so, so typical. Which one, which reality are we going to take? And I just can't figure out, again, this whole thing with the concept of God. Why would he want worshipers of religion, an army, to fight who? If you're God, why? I can't understand the concept of an enemy because that brings in dualism. Yep. And it reminds me of Captain Kirk in Star Trek V going up to this god who he, who he was close to buying 
And all of a sudden, this God the saying, undiscovered country. No, it was actually um, the final frontier. The front, yeah, the final frontier. And he says, "Bring the starship close, so I can merge with it. It'll carry my glory to the universe." And Kirk's like, "Excuse me, wait a minute. <laughs> what does God need with a starship? <laughs> what does God need with worship? What does God need with an army?" <laughs> and in that same show, at the end, that same movie, Spock and McCoy are looking out the 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 view screen at this planet and kirk walks up and he says cosmic thoughts gentlemen and mccoy's like yeah is is god really out there and kirk see people know this stuff kirk says maybe god's not out there at all maybe he's right here in the human heart dun 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 bam bam in your face in your face and in yet how it is today as we now search for these answers you know we see our species and chaos we see um i just read something uh with the barner group and uh pew research as well uh and i'm going to do a video on it doing what you is probably the best most objective yeah. accurate research group out there so i'm d doing a video this week and um on the number one growing belief atheism, atheism? yeah, yeah. It's now surpassing in growth by percentage every other religion that's out there. Absolutely. And the one that is still taking it on the chin and it's becoming a crisis is Christianity. It seems like, Jeff, the, the, the fabric is unweaving every time you try to put it on. It's like a yep. shawl that's getting thinner and thinner. Yep. Wayne, that's why I had so much work as an evangelist because they knew that they could bring me in and four things were going to happen. People were going to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. They were going to get really good offerings. People were going to get healed. And I was going to increase their church attendance by somewhere around 20% going forward. Because they were hurting way back then. Way back then they were hurting. But Wayne, I think, and somebody said this to me, my, my friend, Dr. Andy Toltec, and Wayne, I really don't know, because I never met him face to face, never actually saw him saw a picture of him. I don't know if he was an astral ally or if he was a real person. I talked to him on the phone. I know that sounds weird, but he told me that um, atheism is often a requisite stopover for people that have been indoctrinated by human religion. Before they can get from indoctrination to true enlightenment, it takes a time in atheism for you to figure out, oh, it's not God that I don't believe in. It's religion I don't believe in. That's what it is. Someone asked me, well, Wayne, what would you classify? And I said, well, if you got to put a label, I am more anti-theist. Yeah. I defy labels. I will not label myself. Yeah. I said, you know, if you're going to have to put me into a box, then, you know, it would be anti-theist because. Yeah. That's perfectly stated. Yeah. Uh, and you know what I have found? And it's, it's interesting. We're talking about this. My mornings when I wake up. I used to wake up in um, the feeling as an indentured servant. Yes. And now I wake up a free mind. Paul even says, Thank, be thankful that you're slaves. <whistles> and the word in Greek is slaves. Slaves. <clears throat> Who wants to be a slave? Who wants what kind to of a do God that? Has slaves what kind of a god demands worship what kind of a god needs an army what does god need with a starship <laughs> we have I a love question that. for you i have a yeah. question for you emerald tablets of toth i'm very into them they really resonate with me and toth talks about inside the earth the halls there, of amenti the halls of amenti the seven elohim are there i don't know if they're physically there or they're there just you know, as their presence is there and they're there by this river of life that they're able to alter stop. I believe that he's saying that in the center of the earth, they have learned and we're going to learn how to step out of time and be renewed and be refreshed. We learn how to live outside of time. Now from your scientific knowledge and, you know, talking with uh, Dr. What's the lady's name you talk about? Oh, the Dr. Albers. Dr. Albers. Is there anything with uh, planetary geophysics that if we go to the center of the earth, I know there's profound gravimetric um, issues, but would there be in the center of a planet 
how would time be affected in the very center of a planet? Or would Excellent it question, because we predicate time based upon a 24-hour perception. Right. And that's the first illusion that has to be uh, eviscerated. Time is not by a minute or by a second. Time is by a linear energy flow. Wow. You know, I just got reminded of this, and everybody knows I like Elvis, but Elvis had this song that said, if time were not a moving thing, I could make it stay, and this hour of love we share would always be. There'd be no coming day to shine its morning light and make us realize that our night is over. We can do that. It, the, the human soul longs to move outside of time, and Wayne, I think we can, but is it a natural phenomenon in the center of a planet that time would stop? Yes, I, I would recommend you a book called Edadorfa. I'll send it to you. Oh, okay. And it will... It will expand your horizons about the earth. So I'll just give you the short and the skinny of it. Please. Perfect energy, zero energy, is a place where there is motionless. Mm. Thought is a vibration and an opposing force. And perfect peace means perfect stillness. It does, doesn't it? It does. And you know even the word biblically means perfect peace because nothing is broken, nothing is lacking. Right. And there is a place in consciousness where... The zero point, as Sandra just said. It's the zero point. It's, the zero, it's, it's absolutely no thought, no movement, no nothing. And the only thing that disturbs it is when another thought moves in. And then the ripples do exactly that. So... There is a thought that within the earth, there is the, what we call the master caretakers. Yeah. They are the ones who always have been there. They're the ones who keep the records. And this is a portal. The deeper you go, the more the surface no longer applies in laws of physics, laws of logic, or laws of understanding. My goosebumps have goosebumps, Wayne. It's, it's, it's profound when you begin to understand it. And the story goes is the man who, is, the, the, in, in you, the character you learn, is the man who started it all. And as he's going down, he realizes, and by the way, the cave entrance is in um, uh, western Kentucky. And you know, Toth said that there was a portal underneath the Great Pyramid. Yes, so the so thought is, cave can we go to that cave entrance? They say, yeah, yeah. Sounds like it's, a road trip. Well, it's Mammoth Caves. Really? Yes. Oh. They don't let you in the back. It wow. goes down, down, down. And How many people oh, know this, Wayne? There's a whole society that knows about this. Um, I started doing a video series on the secret societies. I got a, uh, a warning to back off. So I said, okay, you know, I can dig that. There, there is a knowledge that is held uh, by the races that, um, you know, I think it's profound. And you can understand why they try to keep it from us, Wayne. Sure. Because yeah. if there's a place that we can go to where we can step outside of time, and where he can move into our full divinity. And, and the thing about the tablets is it says that we have to spend 100 years in incarnation. And at the end of that 100 years, we get the choice to decide not if we're going to help others, but how we're going to be of service to others. And the last thing that the powers that be want is people to, number one, get themselves divine, sovereign, and free. Number two, it would be that they would want us to be divine, sovereign, and free and helpful to others. They want yeah. us to keep us at each other's throats. And, and when they do that, that creates a force and energy that unfortunately today is being fed by us. Wayne, we create the force field that keeps us from entering into our total divinity sovereignty. One day we're going to figure this out as a species, you know, and, and that kind of brings up in a sidetrack. I want to continue on the earth, but that day's coming. But here's the thing that I had wrote. Um, why has God stopped writing? 
when you think about it, supposing the last thing we heard from this character was over 2,000 years ago, how can a 21st century mind have anything in relationship to a 1st century mind, and would not a God understand that our needs would be far different than someone 2,000 years ago? Anyway. You know, um, Wayne, I was on Coast to Coast AM, and I said to George, George said to me, George Norrie, Jeffrey, why do so many people have such false perceptions about the Bible and the book of Revelation in general? I'm like, well, George, it's simple. <laughs> the book of Revelation was written by a guy walking down a dusty road riding on the back of a camel. <laughs> Today, we're driving down the road in smart cars, <laughs> holding smartphones connected to the universe, and we still refuse to look through a 21st century lens at the writings of the first century, and we're still thinking like we're on the back of a donkey walking down a dusty road. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the insanity of this. It is so stupid. I know Sophia doesn't like me to use the word stupid, but like the great American philosopher Forrest Gump said, stupid is as stupid does, and sometimes there's just no other word. And unfortunately, Ron White says it's very hard to fix stupid. Well, we could say imbecile. We could say <laughs> weak-minded. We could say, so to finish the, uh, the story on the book of Edadorpha, which is um, uh, Aphrodite, Aphrodite, excuse Aphrodite, me. Aphrodite, yes. Yeah, so it's her name spelled backwards. Oh, okay. And, and so as he continues to descend down, he goes through a place where there are statues. And these are the souls that got lost into their evil. They became so trapped by their own reality that this is where they are. They stay there until they say until time that they begin to see a different way. But as he continues to travel down, the thing that he noticed is that the darkness was light. You see, photons never stop. We've been sold this bill of goods that darkness is bad, and darkness is requisite for us to find our true selves. By the Bible, if you could believe that, and listen, folks, if you read it, in the beginning, in the beginning was darkness. But it's not darkness the way we perceive darkness to be anyway. As you and go talk, further, talk to Wayne Steiger, talk to Sandra D, talk to Rex, talk to Heidi, talk to Jenny, talk to me if you want to. One of the common denominators in all of us, I know you, I know, baby, one of the common denominators in all of us is that we have been to that dark night of the soul. We have been to that deep, dark, ugly place where we're crying like babies, snot all over our faces, laying on the floor in the fetal position. You've got to get to that darkness. Look at it, embrace it, wallow in it, work through it, or you will never, ever be who you want to be. As Sandra just said in another great intuitive burst, the darkness holds, and I'm going to add a little bit to it, the darkness holds our deepest truth. As the saying, as I teach people, when you get to that point, just close your eyes and imagine you're walking and you're coming up to a precipice. And as you peer into it, you know this. Whatever you're going to see is going to be your greatest fear. It's the fear that you will not acknowledge. That's right. And when you peer over, what you see is yourself. And you know, Wayne, there's this old saying that, again, is, is meant to frighten us. My cat is just going nuts. <laughs> it's meant to frighten us from doing what we're supposed to do. You know the old saying? Be careful if you look into the abyss because the abyss looks into you. Yeah. And that's exactly the way it's supposed to be. If you really want to change your life, if you really want to be the person you want to be, if you really want to move from service to self from, to service to others, you must look into the abyss. You must let the abyss look into you. You have to go into the darkness. You have to go into the darkness of your soul, the dark night of the soul. And let me tell you something. You got to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You have to. But don't believe the hype. You can fear no evil. You know why? Because you're divine, you're sovereign, you're free, and that means you're the biggest, baddest SOB in the valley, and you will get through it if you have the guts to go into it. 
Yeah, and, and the great thing about it is, is that here's what I learned. When I faced that moment, in my case, I actually had a rope around my neck. Wow. And when you face that thin line and you begin to look into it and you pierce it, when I began to, and it took, it took a while, but I began to find that I began to relish in my imperfection. Because That's what I the found, real work is. Yeah, because in my imperfections, I am already made perfect. I didn't ever uh, realize it. Named Jesus said something like that. <laughs> All right, got to put the tip in the jar. No, that's for me, not you. <laughs> but, but he did say that, Wayne, and think about yeah. that. And it doesn't make any sense. In our weaknesses, we are made strong. What is he saying? He's saying, oh, this is so huge. Show later today. In our weakness, <laughs> we're made strong. What's he saying, Wayne? He's saying is that you have to go to that dark night of the soul and work through it to be made strong and the people that will not face their dark night of the soul will never be strong. They'll never be divine. They'll never be sovereign. They'll never be free. And it, I reminded of another scripture where he said, if you fall on the rock, you're going to be crushed. It's going to be crushing to your ego to realize and to look at all that darkness in you and those things that are the dark night of the soul. But he said, if you don't fall on the rock, you're going to be ground to powder and you will blow away and exist in nothingness. So and is here, it going to hurt? Yeah. Is it going to be comfortable? No. Do you still have to do it if you want to be who you're supposed to be? Absolutely. There's no way around. The only way around is the way through. So here's what I learned. There's no demon in hell, no devil that can bring any charge against me. No. I look at it and I said, so what? That's who I am. I am made perfect in my imperfections. Yep. And that's, I'll tell you, there's freedom in that. There's no spirit that can harm me. There's nothing that can touch this. And, you know, Sanders asked the question, what does the Bible, the beginning of the Bible say again about darkness? And I'll take a little exception. I think if we read the whole thing, in the beginning, beginning, there was light, and it got turned into darkness by the actions of the being that was impersonating Yahweh. But your point still holds, Wayne, that at our beginning, the beginning of us as entities and as beings on this planet, there was darkness initially. And that darkness is not understood by us at all. There's a story in the bronze books um, that I found interesting of the story of creation that the initial people that were here were born or created under a different light. Um, it is said to have been the light of Saturn. And we know and, that the light that we're in now is debilitating to our bodies. Boy, I, there's a story right there. I'm pointing to it. But where why I does it feel so good to lay in the sun, Wayne? So energizing. Well, because it's, it's, that's, that's the deception. Uh -huh. There is a, a, a source of energy from it. It's this, that this one, this one has a little package it carries with it. So Sandra and I loving, you know, being sun worshipers and, Open season, Wayne. Do you think we're a little bit deceived? Well, I would be very cautious with this sun right now. This sun is, it's dangerous. That's all I can say. When I was a kid, uh, my, we were poor. Uh, we had a, an acre garden. My brother and I got up at the sunrise. We, we lived out in the Texas Gulf Plains, hot. Uh, we would weed that garden from sun up to sundown. And you know, we never got sunburnt, got great tans, was toad heads, you know, turned our hair was white. But the fact was the, the sun wasn't harmful. This one here, it's, uh, it's not good. In fact, it's interesting, Jeff, a little scientific fact for you. On Tuesday, on my birthday, in fact, um, here's the thing. The solar wind speed dropped to 200 million kilometers per second. It should, it's been low. It should be about 350, not 200. So the sun is weak. That's a lot of radiation, my friend. Just make sure you're well covered. That's all. Yeah, I mean, we are in the sun yeah. at least three hours a week, and we love it, and I feel energized. I mean, I'm fasting. Yesterday, I was, I'm in the fifth day of a fast, and I was feeling a little low yesterday, so I go out, 
and I lay in the sun, I get my feet on the earth, I'm grounding, and I really felt very energized by it, but usually we'll stay out in the sun hour and a half or so, but I got to an hour and I began to feel weak and dizzy, and that was probably because of the fasting, but I have a real difficult, I have difficulty accepting this idea about the sun simulator. I have difficulty accepting this idea about the sun being bad. When I do sun gazing and I go in the sun and I feel so energized and Sandra feels so energized too. So it's a conundrum in my mind, Wayne. I, you know, I don't know. You know, <clears throat> I look at the satellite data, by the way, just want to share everyone. This is me in 1976. You're the one on the left, right? Yeah, I'm right here. I just wonder if there's another story that you hadn't told us. <laughs> no, this was at a, I just, I found this yesterday. Someone sent it to me and uh, I just what thought year? I, uh, 1976. Well, your hair was even longer than mine, Wayne. I had oh, some long hair, but yeah. I wasn't a hippie. I was a rock and roller, buddy. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. I was into country. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I can just tell you what the data is. Uh, these coronal holes they're sending bad stuff to us. The, the, the gamma radiation that's hitting the earth, we are, it's bad. I mean, we're, we're, we're getting increases now into the 14, 17% increases. That's not good. And the sun right now you, is in a weakened state. And so when it doesn't have that protection that it normally has up in the corona, that allows more heavy particles, radiation, to penetrate the earth. Your DNA, my DNA, is being impacted when these heavy uh, I, uh, I, ions hit us. And so just be careful. They, you know, you, there's, a, there's a third UV radiation now that they're putting in the, uh, the blocks. So if you didn't know Sandra and I like you do, would you tell us stay out of the sun? I'd say limit yourselves. But, you know, you may have a genetic um, propensity to resist that. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. I, it's um, something I struggle with a little bit. You know, I was out doing yard work yesterday, and the sun actually was stinging my skin. It was exceptionally hot here yesterday as well, as I've already discussed. Yeah, and, you know, when we had, uh, earlier this week, we had a cold front move through up here, and I went out, and even in the day it only hit 71, the sun still stings yeah. our skin. So Shane says moderation, Jeff. Well, Sandra and I don't do moderation particularly well. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm going to be just very candid. I don't think there's a whole lot of people who do. I mean, that, that is a, that's a discipline to master. Um, frugalness is one thing, but uh, I don't know, Jeff. Here's what I keep on thinking. Charles Crownhammer passed away on Thursday. Yeah. I, I enjoyed his last, his last yes. column. Yes, I powerful, did. It? it was. I, I truly loved that man. I loved his intellect. And um, we I shared. I had a chance to meet him when I was with Pat Buchanan, and he was a true gentleman. Yes, yes. Um, I love his ideology and how he wrote, uh, particularly in the views of society. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know this, but Brett Baer, um, Yep. He was with Fox News. Fox News. Yeah, I've known Brett. And, Which I hate, but it's okay. Yeah. But I did not know this, that Charles, in the last couple of years, became very focused in on death. Hmm. What did death really mean? What is the experience? What is it that we're truly doing? He asked the same questions that many of us do. How can a spirit go over and yet feel? How can it have a sense of perception of time? These are the questions that we all ask. And I, I marvel at this because Dean, what I'm trying to drive to the point is, Jeff, I think that's part of this awareness, this awakening. It's kind of when you reckon with the fact, and I mean really do it. That's why I think most people buy the pacifism of religion, is that it allows you to push this off to where you don't have to deal with it. Well, I'm going to heaven. Yeah. You know, it's like that stump that kid did uh, that they were doing for the YouTube, you know, where he had his girlfriend. He had an encyclopedia and shoot him with a 50 caliber gun. Now, of course, we know the result of that. But here's what he said. 
well, I'm prepared to meet Jesus, although he's probably going to reject me because of what I've lived. And I thought, ain't that the truth? <laughs> Wayne Sanders says, it's almost like we're in stasis here and death is the portal to what's real. Oh, how, how, Sandra, I'm going to tell you, this is interesting. Deeply profound, because it's, that's exactly right. We're here. Can you read I, that? I am trapped within my body, my mind. And my mind is. Is, yep. I am convinced, Wayne, that we are spirits trapped in this soul, and we're here until we do the work that we've talked about. We will stay here, and you got to do the work, and once you do, you get to get out of this place. Can I share a thought with you? I shared this a Friday, and it, it hit me. Jeff, last Wednesday, um, now I practice a form of meditation where it's not, where it's, it's a different type. I, I actually, I can walk and not be walking. I don't know if that makes sense. Anyway, so I have been getting the strangest impressions of late. And I know our hour is up, but I'll just share this out. Well, we can keep going. Um, I get this distinct sense that I am going to meet myself when I pass through, cross over. I got this strange sense that I am witnessing outside what I'm living right now. There's more than one of us, Wayne. I'm convinced of it. Yeah. Yeah. I came to this thought the other day. I don't know what show I was doing, but you know, a lot of people have been talking to me about walk-ins and I'm just wondering, and I, you know, I pick 11 cause I like 11. What if in all these quantum realities within, a, you know, 11 of them are in like a little group and there's 11 Jeffs and Waynes and Sandras and Elizabeths and Jerry's and Pierce and think simply's and Gary's and they're all, we all got each other's back. And if we're in one of our quantum realities, and we start sagging and getting low, one of the strong ones will go in there and help you. Yeah. And it just seems like the, the, our higher self, and I'm almost ready to say our higher selves, we work as a team. Is I kind of absolutely crazy? No, because I, 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 um, I, I had an out-of-body experience in the shower, literally. I told you this. Water where rushing I, over your body. Water's a great conduit. Yeah, That's so I, uh, it was last November. And um, still remember it as though it was right now. I literally stepped through this thing we call death. It, and it's, it's not death. It's, a, it's literally a life, life portal. And as I stepped through, there were people waiting for me. They didn't yeah. have physical bodies, but I knew that they were there. It's like they were expecting me. Now, here's the strange thing about it. When I stepped through... I had, which would be about the equivalency of this mouse, but it was a translucent white stone. Uh, and um, I went back. It was my place. I knew it was my Wayne, place. Did the stone, as you look at that stone in your mind, did the stone have like striations in it or was it perfectly clear? I bet it had striations. It had striations. It you was know what those all. Were, brother? What? That's the record of your life or your life. You were holding your own data core of all of the lives that you've lived and maybe will live. Wow. Okay. Ready for this? I was told that I won't be going through again. Um, that, but this is what I do. This is apparently what I do. And as I stepped into my, I can only say it was a room, but there was a console. And on this console were other stones. Yeah. And I put this one down. Now here's the strange thing. Immediately, what only thing I can call it is a presence. And it started talking to me. And I remember this. Um, mm, my wife. And it was the essence of our love Wayne that's so powerful that's so powerful and Sandra and I you know we're drawn together by that we've talked about this and you know we don't want to be together just in this life we want to be together throughout eternity and I think that we have been together throughout eternity I think you and Lynn have been together throughout eternity and we're just finally 
getting ourselves squared away enough that we can get back to where we're supposed to be. Well, this is what the presence told me. <clears throat> Anytime I want to experience it, I can go and activate it. Absolutely. And here's the strange things, Jeff. There were many of these stones on this console. Were they all yours? Yes. Uh, that's I, Wayne, I've met other Jeffs in other quantum realities. I go to them and I ask for help. I ask for advice. Yeah. Halo Marquise, my buddy, he actually works with them. And he, he says he'll get stuff done and he doesn't know how he got it done. He can only say and believe that it's his other selves and other dimensionalities working with them. And my great desire is to learn how to focus the energy and the effectiveness of all the me's into this particular timeline to exponentially increase my creativity and exponentially increase, increase my ability to be of service to others. Well, that was my experience. And when I came back, I was, I was sitting in the shower just crying like a baby. I mean, it still wow. impacts me. How did you me. know if the shower was on you? How do you know you were crying? Because <sighs> when I came out, I was just, I, I just, uh, I went in. Yep. You know, when it transcends the physical, you know, it's, it's here. Here's another gem from Sandra. She says, it sounds like collecting soul fragments. Hmm. Could be. Could be. Could be. All I know is that I knew when I stepped through, it was very familiar. And when I came out, you know, I told Lynn, you know, the whole story because, you know, I love my wife. And um, it can be uh, powerful. Oh, it's just amazingly powerful. It's, it's, it's beyond powerful. It's, I think, my friend, you're tapping into the realities of reality. I mean, somebody said to Sandra and I on a chat that, because we were talking about, oh, somebody said that it was on Santos Bonacci over on Heidi's channel. You should go watch yeah. that show. Santos said that, and you know that, uh, we're not going to get into it, but you know that uh, Sandra had a profound experience with Lord Shiva. And I wear this Lord Shiva medallion, and Lord Shiva on this is black. And Sandra saw Lord Shiva manifesting as black. And Santos said that, you know, everybody thinks Shiva is blue, but originally Shiva was always presented as black. And somebody said, well, Jeff, you and Sandra are actually tapping into real old school core spirituality. And that's what you're doing, my friend. Mm -hmm. It's profound. It really is. It's, um, and it just gives you a certain inner peace. I mean, it kind of just, it's like, okay, I can check that box off. I get it. Yeah. You know, now I can live the moment. And that's the, that's the whole thing is learning how to live in the now. And Wayne, I've, you've mastered that. I can even tell by your speech because you know, everybody says, and I'm going to start adopting this. Everybody says, well, I'm, you know, I'm 55 years old or whatever. But you're saying I've been here however many 23,000 days. 23,000 days. And doesn't that focus you on the day to day, the now, and make you realize the necessity and the gift of maximizing every single day? Don't think in terms of years, mm -mm. think in terms of days. Because, like the old saying is, your, your life is not measured by the number of breaths you take but it's measured by the number of moments that take your breath away. Yes. That's why, you know, we talked about last week. I love saying 168 hours. Better than seven days. Because yeah. now I can more further define that hour. You know, I could say, Jeff, you know, on Monday at 11 o'clock, I was doing such and such. And anyway, it's, it, it's freeing, Jeff. That's about the best thing I can say. And I'm learning. I'm still learning. The one thing I'm having to teach myself is to keep disengaged from something that I always truly enjoyed, and that was the political uh, arena. Yeah. And that's, that's been a big word with Sandra lately, disengage, and it's yeah. so profound. And it's funny, Sandra says we need to focus more on our speech. Thoughts are things. Words are either the wrecking balls or the building blocks of your life, and the quality of your life depends upon the quality of not only the questions you ask yourself, but of the words you say to yourself. Yeah. And yeah. thinking about hours and days instead of years in life. And I, Elizabeth Lloyd says, 
she got some rods for me and they helped her find her eyeglasses about a month ago. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> they, work. they work. They do. Well, this has wow. been fun, brother. This is really this has fun. been so yeah. good. I mean, these these are just getting better and better. Yeah, yeah. I I look forward to them. I really do. Um, it's uh, it's it's one of the th joys of life now. It's that there is a. I always look forward to the anticipated speaking that's coming through. And uh, yeah, yeah. Let me let me ask you one more question as we wrap up. Why sitting here? Day five of a fast, no food. You would think that I'd be running down. You think I would be low energy. You think I would be hungry. How is it possible that I'm extremely high energy, rocking and rolling five days into a fast? What is it? Because your energy is not going to the physical part of breaking down food. The what was it? I did a video on this. To when we eat, it takes up over. 82% of our core energy to simply wow. break the food down to turn it into energy. It's a very inefficient way. So what I believe you're doing and you're mastering it is that you're learning now that the energy that you have is not necessarily necessary for the sustaining of calories. Sandra Your body says, is... Go ahead. Ahead. No, go ahead. Sandra eats three to five meals a week and she just said food has been made to block us we can't digest more than four ounces of meat at a time wayne you've hit on a huge truth you and sandra have been on this this uh, wavelength together and i and i'm picking up on it food and it, if you think about it logically it makes perfect sense that food is one of the great blockages to our healthy lives and to our healthy spirituality because we eat all this food i mean think of how much food americans eat no. next time you sit down to eat look at your plate you could feed a small village for a week with the food on your plate. That's only a little bit of uh, hyperbole. And you're slowing yourself down. I'm five days without a bite, and I feel fantastic. I went 14 days. I'm going 11. Not only does it get you in great physical shape and help you be physically optimized, but you two are right. Food has been made to block us, and we've just got to stop eating so much of it. I said that the... When I get to meet the uh, creator, you know, I already have met him, but I'm saying here, the efficiencies of the grays, you know, if you believe in the aliens, is the fact that I read in one document when they did uh, an examination on them, is that their skin has the ability to take all the nutrients, all the moisture in the environment that they are in. Now, imagine yep. if you didn't have to do with the lungs, you didn't have to do with the stomach and everything else. Jeff, we would probably, we wouldn't die. And Max Vision, as you said that, just said that restricted calorie diets extend your life. And it is proven. Gary just said something great. Eat to live, don't live to eat. Especially mm -hmm. in Christianity, Wayne, what's it all about? You don't drink, smoke, or chew, or hang out with those that do. But boy, you hit a buffet. You hit, I mean, I went out with R.W. Shambach. <laughs> on several occasions and he's like he's like brother Jeff, let's find us a buffet i would he, he would say it's time for a body ministry i want to minister to myself take me to a buffet we used to um, and rw could stack a plate brother let me tell you he could yeah I, I went out dating with him a couple of times <laughs> and, and it's so true when we were up in the charismatic movement back there in the late 70s and he'd and say, early. Go give me one just like this <laughs> and you know, when the church would let out, because we'd start about 8 o'clock and get out about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the manager finally got hip to what was going on because he said, you know, the first time you folks came through here, you wiped us out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what, Jeff, we're learning. We are. We are. We are. It's, it's so funny. You yeah, know, so I, funny. I tell people that actually all you need is one meal a day. Mm -hmm. That's all you, you need, really need, and you will feel better, and you will look better, and that physical optimization will lead to spiritual optimization, period. Yeah, you get to find that real battle, you know, how your yeah. body, that's why I talk to my body. I love my body, and I speak to it now, because you go on to a fast the first time, your body's going to be talking to you. Is it not true? The first time I fasted for extended period, the first two days were really, really tough. And then I broke into another place. And this time, 
it's it hasn't been tough at all because I've you know I've I've trained myself. Yeah. My body's like, okay, this guy's shutting us down. Yeah. We, there's no 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 need to complain because he's gonna do it. But even on a regular basis, a real basis when we're eating, Wayne, um, Sandra and I fast fully on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. Every week we don't eat a bite on those days. The other days, and sometimes Saturday too. The other days we will eat one meal a day. So there's a reason why Sandra is between five, two and five, three, a hundred pounds and the most beautiful thing that ever walked on earth. Well, there's answers to all of this. There's answers to all of this. And if you have any issues in your life or problems in your life and you want to step it up, go to rawreflections.org. That woman will get you dialed in. Wayne, wrap this up before we're here for another hour. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's uh, a great day, folks. Go out and enjoy it. And I just want to say this. You know, it used to be when I would make a mistake that I would basically reprimand myself. Now I just love myself. And I, I, I literally, I say, well, there you go. You know, that's why you're here. Wayne, most people don't make enough mistakes. No. Most people play it too close to the vest. They're, try, they're afraid to try. They're afraid to dare. And they live in that, that dull, gray lifeless world of never trying to do anything you ought to fail more and if you want to have a better life fail more try yeah. things that stretch your abilities do dare to do something audacious and great in your life if you fail so what what's love yourself saying? for it man what's the old saying shoot for the stars if you miss you'll at least get to the moon or something like that yeah yeah you know, set goals, but the point is, you know, love yourself. That's why you're here. You're here to learn by your mistakes. Embrace them. And Jay Mann says, I'm great at failing. Well, good for you, brother. You Keep go. failing. And I mean, it wasn't it Edison, or oh, I think he stole this quote from Tesla. He said, I didn't have 100,000 failures at making the electric light bulb. I just found 100,000 ways that weren't the best way to do it. That's how you work it. <laughs> so keep trying. Keep trying, keep trying. Get up if you fail, brush yourself off, and get back on your hoss. <laughs> there you go. I love it. <laughs> All right. For oh. Wayne Steiger and for Sandra D, I'm Jeffrey Darty, and Sandra just sent me a message that said autobiography of a yogi. So I want to make sure that we recommend that book to you. I've Next. read it. Powerful book. And Wayne, go to Wayne's channel, R. Wayne Steiger, and subscribe. And I don't know what to say, but wow, this is fantastic. Have a great week, my friend. You too as well. And we're going to do that. We're going to make it a great week. And thank you for helping us make it a great week. Well, thank you, Jeff. We salute all of you that are here seeking after truth. For R. Wayne Steiger, I'm Jeffrey Darty, reminding you to unindoctrinate yourself. And of course, that is an inside job.